Turn it over. Yeah. We're good to go. Okay. Welcome everybody to the budget workshop. Scott, that pass it off to you. Thanks, Merritt. Um, so we have uh, Sarah and I are both available to kind of walk you through the budget in brief, so to speak. Um, and, then, and then we do have a workshop scheduled for next Tuesday um, where um, be able to elaborate on any questions you have. And by then you'll have had uh, the opportunity to, we should have out um, by end of day tomorrow or maybe beginning of uh, Thursday, have the opportunity, we'll put the online and for the council, the budget book, which has, you know, more of the detail. Uh, so we'll, we'll run you through the PowerPoint presentation here. Um, Sarah, I think I can probably just um, run it off the. Sure. Let's keep our fingers crossed that I can do that. Oh, John, I need. Uh, let's see. I was a little slow on the switch. Try it again, sir. That's okay. Let me uh, pull it up here. Where are you? I'm going to shut down a few things on my computer so we don't don't slow her to a crawl here. Right. So tonight, the plan is to basically give you a presentation format of the the 2021-22 budget. Um, which I'm going to share with you. Can everybody see? Uh, I think you want to switch the display settings. You're you're uh, doing the speaker notes side to us. There. Yep. Now hit it again. Again, yeah, let me change it here. There you go. Bingo. All right, I got the thanks for bearing with me, Council. I hadn't, hadn't practiced this in a while, so it shows, unfortunately. So Uh, this evening, we're going to go through uh, the 2020 projected results to give you some context of how we're kind of um, gliding into the 2021 year. Our, a reminder about our fiscal planning and how we implement uh, the bigger picture fiscal planning for the city. We'll be talking about what the guiding principles that the city administrator used um, in, in putting together this budget, the themes that are included what everybody is interested in typically is the annual levy increase result. We'll, we'll discuss the projected levy versus what the fiscal plan, um, approved fiscal plan projected. We'll talk about the 2021 capital improvement plan and what our plans are for capital improvement planning going forward. And then uh, not to forget the enterprise funds and then lastly, we'll talk about the steps uh, remaining in the budget process. So starting with 2020, a little bit of discussion on that. 
we had a, a kind of low low range of the initial estimate is where we're we're heading into looks like so we provided you some estimates in uh april may i believe that said here's kind of some of the impacts that could occur based on COVID expenses and things coming coming through we're we're ending up i'd say on the lower end of the initial estimate in a good way obviously there's many months of this left to go um we're we're not expecting that we're done here um on on october 12th or 13th but right now so far so good so we did we did see a significant uh revenue reduction based on the closing of the school district and the university primarily um, however building permits have been pretty significantly higher than we're budgeted they're not necessarily a lot higher than they've been historically but we were pretty conservative on our budget for permits so so we're seeing that that come in higher than the budget and then we did we were the benefactor of cares funding uh federal funding that came through the state to the governor's office um, of two hundred fifty seven thousand to help cover uh covid specific expenses so we have made building modifications we've done some adjustments in technology we've made uh had to do supplies and materials such as hand sanitizers and and more paper towels and things in the bathrooms but for the most part um the cares funding plus the building permit should put us in a pretty reasonable shape understanding that all of these revenues don't match expenditure funds so a lot of the reduction in revenue was in the enterprise funds we're not we're not proposing to take the cares fund and put it into the electric fund so so understand that we're talking on a broad base broad brush citywide but there's different impacts within the different funds. So the good news is we we do not expect fund balance use for 2020. We did an, we've accomplished that in a couple of ways. Um, one, we've had some unanticipated revenue that we just talked about, but we also did a pretty significant general fund expense reductions um, early on in the in the evolution of this this pandemic we we made some decisions that we uh that have panned out so to speak so we did a citywide hiring freeze that excluded ems we did do some high some minor hiring throughout the year for ems to keep them staff uh, we reduced road maintenance planned road maintenance uh, costs um, we did halt some capital projects uh, and then we restricted spending on a number of items, including some of the ones that are mentioned here. Um, it, it, not to mention, you know, there was there was some natural reduction in some of those spending too, given the restrictions on COVID. We weren't sending a lot of people on conferences and travel and things. And then we've prohibited a lot of the meals um, so that there's some expenditure savings there. So that's about that that's over a half a million dollars in expenditure reduction um and i believe actually going into 2020 we expected to use we had budgeted some use of fund balance for some capital projects and things so to have no fund balance given all the circumstances i think just puts us in a really good foot going forward um and we you'll notice when we talk about 2021 we're not suggesting that we just take all this fund balance that we're building and and use it to plug gaps and holes it's it's building a little bit uh, more of a foundation for us going forward and it's building up some of our um, reserve balances to the uh to the to the policy balances of those 50 percent we'll talk a little bit about that later on so don't want to talk uh, you know don't want to overemphasize this but certainly um we had a drop in revenues during the, the large customers so we did implement uh those same types of initiatives into that revenue loss the the only fund that i'm a little bit concerned about as far as an operating loss would be electric i think 
the primary choices we would have had to make to ensure or to give us our best chance of having an operating income still in 2020 would have been um, layoffs or impacts to staff, which given the amount of development activity we have and, and electric related um, construction didn't, didn't make a lot of sense to me to do. So we're probably gonna slide in close to even um, or with a slight loss in electric and part of that is in due to the fact that we didn't want to implement the customer increase as soon as we were able. So we did um, intentionally delay the uh, approved PSC approved customer uh, rate increase a couple months, and that certainly would have um, resulted in in more revenue for us. But we thought it's something we could do so that we would do. And I'm realizing and I'm, that I may have an older version of the PowerPoint here. Is that correct, Sarah? Based on what I'm seeing on the screen right now. Nope, it's, we're good. Okay. I, I, so far, so good. I will let you know if we're not. Um, so the context of the budget is something that is asked about a lot. Their philosophy in some organizations is that the budget is the number one policy document in the organization. And, you know, that's where all the rubber hits the road and that's where all the decisions are being made. A good context for the council is to remind you the all that you've, you've suggested on several occasions. And I, I believe in that professionally that the budget is an important plan, one of many plans, um, and one of many fiscally related plans. So the budget in River Falls tends to be a little anticlimactic intentionally because we built we built a strong foundation on strategic plan, fiscal plan, the comp plan, all these different business plans. Each of the TIDs has a plan, the capital improvement plan. And so there's been some haggling discussion, policy debate over all of those items. And, and then the budget, the challenge for the administrator and the finance director is to kind of look at all those plans and then work that into the, the budget plan. And then ultimately the council is asked then to adopt the levy fees and charges that are funding the budget plan. So um, the budget is a guide within those two years. Um, within the fiscal plan. We don't just stick to every plan. You know, we've got to, got to look at all the circumstances. So obviously, as we come into this two year budget plan, we refer to the fiscal plan and all these other things, but we, we have to do some consistent monitoring to see what the conditions are. And we've made some adjustments. It, frankly, primarily in kind of pulling back some of the planned expenditures or expansions of city services um, or additional resources to be put into certain areas of the city um, based on our growth. So um, that is kind of where we're at in the process is, is kind of baking that cake of the budget, looking at all these different ingredients. So the, the guiding principles, why, what are, how does the council know if we're on the right track or the same track as what they have they would like us to be on as staff? These are the things that we used based on the feedback um, from, from all of you throughout these different plans and, and then some professional judgment and guidance um, of our own. So the impact, we think there will be an impact um, and there will likely be a financial recession expected in 2021. We're assuming that that is gonna, going to take place in our assumptions about how we plan to go forward. So we do not believe that 2021 will, will be business as usual or back to normal or, or in, a, in a broad sense. Now, there's certainly some indicators we have that tell us that some parts of our business or some things that are impacted in the city may in fact look normal in 21, um, namely development. It seems to be trending that way given the submitted projects that we're having in the fall here. But, but overall, we're not, 
we're not banking on that. So we're just assuming that our partners, the state, is not necessarily going to be as generous as they've been able to be in the past, that there may not be a fiscal aid package from the federal government that has any impact on, on the city government directly and may not necessarily impact our residents or businesses in a way that allows them to continue their their spending in the way that they have historically so that's just one thing we kind of want to frame from the is we looked at all of our fiscal plans and other things that we have on the books and we just said one big assumption is it's not going to be as good as we thought it might be and and again remembering that our, even our fiscal plans are considered conservative so we don't we don't usually project at the top of how everything could be good but we're saying even though we were conservative in that fiscal plan we we don't want to rely on that for going forward um and scott may i interject here you may i think one of the one of the ways that we're doing that and you'll see this in the detail of the budget is typically we carry a contingency every year and we have a contingency around that we've increased that contingency for 21 by fifty thousand. just recognizing the uncertainty that 2021 might bring. So that's one of the ways that it's being carried forward in the 21 plan. And Sarah, maybe this will get covered at a later point. So if it does, I'll, I'll hold my question, but how are we calculating the contingency? Is it, is it a percentage of the gross budget? Is it a each fund contingent or how are we, how are we calculating that? Or should I wait for that question later? I will give you the exact, it's a percentage of our expenses, but I'll give you the exact policy language if you just give me a minute. Okay. Um, so the second point is, and I alluded to that, shared revenue and state funding, we, we did project them at historic levels, even though we have seen some slight increases in, particularly in transportation aids, we've seen that going up a little bit, no matter who's in, in power, so to speak, at the state, but we didn't assume that that would happen again in 21 and 22. So our prediction is that on the level, shared revenue and state funding is about the same. Um, tax increment districts are important. That's something people need to keep in mind as we, as we um, are putting the budget together. There is certainly, some benefit we're we're reaping the benefits of um previous good decisions by councils um we were really conservative in our projections on tids and we you know basically if we loaned money to tax incremental districts they're paying those things back with interest um and then there is some of that interest payment so to speak coming back into the budget to help us fund things um in the next couple of years the streetlight utility has been approved by the council uh, to implement, and this is kind of a, a phrase that's been repeated here, but um, we have examined each time we're ready to implement the fee, whether or not the fee it's appropriate to do so at, th at this time, or can we, can we get by with another year or six months or something without this fee? Um, and, and staff was able to craft a budget that didn't rely on that um, utility fee. So we've we pushed that out um, in practice, in practical terms, we pushed it out to 2023 because we're not relying on any revenue from that for the, this two year budget projection. Now that's certainly a policy decision. The council could say, you know, we told you we're ready for this fee, get it in place. That could either reduce the property taxes by the amount of the fee increase, or it could give the council some additional funding um, to pay for other priorities. But in this, in our proposal and they said the administrator's budget, there's no no proposed implementation of that fee. Scott, I got a question there. Are we going to take action to suspend that that approval or are we expecting to leave that approval in place and then let the 2023 council deal with it? I my I guess my preference would be to remove that approval. I don't like hanging a, a future council with an approval that was done four years before. Yeah. What's I think, your thought? I think we'd want, I think 
there was some benefit in staff thinking that one through a little bit because I tell you, I, I we didn't really think of it in terms of should we be suspending the approval or we we're just I guess indicating to the council that we're proposing a zero dollar fee for that that utility. Um, but I actually, I'd have to review precisely where we are in the statutory kind of time frame for fee creation and utility creation. So there's likely some steps there for a future council anyways. Um, but I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can precisely answer your question about if I think you should kind of rescind the approval. Certainly the council has the ability to do that. I mean, the council could say, uh, as long as you don't think it's necessary, we're just going to, we want to go on record and tell you, we don't even want the utility fee to be con considered going forward. But, um, I don't mind the utility fee being considered in the future. I just don't really want to hang it on a future council. I don't think that's fair. Um, and I, I, I sure wouldn't like it if, if I was on the 2023 council and I had to deal with somebody else's approval from four years previously, that's my whole point. Um, but it sounds like you need to do some more research and get back to us on that one. So I guess I'll, I'll wait to hear. To answer your question, council member Morissette. So our policy states that, um, we have a contingency of a minimum of 0.5% of the general fund expenditure. So if, if we look at what we are proposing in this budget of a um, general fund budget of 11.4 million per policy, we should have roughly 60,000 in a contingency fund. And I'm proposing in this budget that we have 150,000. Okay, thank you. Of course. Yeah, and from a practical standpoint to council members, all council members, the this is a budgeted contingency, but certainly we are expecting in the department heads to be wise with their funds throughout the year. And it's a very rare occasion where any of our departments runs 99% or 99.5% of their budgeted amount. We, we had, we don't have a spend it or lose it kind of mentality here with our budget. So we spend it if we need it to, even if it's budgeted, we don't necessarily spend it. So we routinely have, you know, half percent to two, two and a half percent. That's a rough in my head. That's not verified, you know, um, under expend, you know, under the budget um, each year. So this is a little extra. It seems pretty insignificant, frankly. I think most of you could say, well, yeah, half of 1%. What? But it does give us a, a ready pot of money to come back to the council and say, here's an un unexpected expense of $40,000 for something, you know, and we have identified where it can come from. Um, but our first, our first goal around is always to go into the departments themselves and say, well, you had an unex, you had an unexpected expense of 40,000. So where is you, where are we going to cut within your budget to, to make up for that? Um, the other things that, that we're, Kind of building in or guiding principles is that we we want to continue going forward with providing good benefits. We have a, a pay plan and we want to try to honor um, and have some competitive salaries that that recruit the right people. Um, that being said, we expect the hiring freeze to remain for 2021 with certain exceptions. Um, and and we would be using that both to offset any cost increase for health and benefits. Um, but also just as an overall cost savings measure to, to keep ourselves in a conservative position going in. The, uh, and we're not assuming that the employee would be kind of eating all of the increases in health insurance or frankly, much of the increase in is, is proposed in 21 that the employer is taking on that, that increase. I think we'll probably talk about that a little bit more. Um, either in this workshop format or, or at the council meeting this evening. Um, and we are going to continue restricting spending on items, including advertising, printing, travel, training, meals, and supplies. That doesn't mean we've necessarily done carte blanche across the board reductions in those things. For example, we, we've actually increased the training budget for the police department. 
And we've held the fire department training pretty much the same, even as other departments are getting getting a reduction. Um, and we're not we're not willing, or at least I'm not willing to propose to you that we do kind of cut all training, travel, meals, et cetera, because I just don't think that's prudent for us. Um, we're going to have to learn new things and and do new things as a staff, and it's important to continue to provide some support. But training is going to be cheaper um, because a lot of it's being delivered electronically and we're cut down on travel. So there may be some long-term changes to that um, that we can see some benefits of. Um, and I apologize if anybody's raising their hand or anything because I can only see a couple of you in my screen view right now. So if it, it, when you do speak up, you count, you show up, but otherwise uh, they'll have to help me out if you need me to slow down. So, so what is the, the what's the themes then? We've got kind of our principles of what, you know, we tried to synthesize as staff about what, what if we think the council and the community want us to do for the budget. We just went over those. And then I do try to consider some themes because it helps us when we're we're putting together things like what what's gonna what where do we make the sacrifices or not make sacrifices when we have to make choices about resources so the the council has fairly consistently reminded me of these three things when we we come to making spending decisions one we don't want to sacrifice future financial st sustainability by making kind of these short-term things that are maybe easier for us because we can hire who we want and we can add new programs and we can kind of pay for things in the short term, but it might have a negative impact. So by and large, as we demonstrated this year with our expenditure reductions, we made the decisions as soon as possible so that they'd have the longest, longest term benefit rather than kind of putting off the inevitable. Um, the councils pretty consistently told me that long term strategic growth is where we want to go, that we're not growing for the sake of growing. Um, but that this is a community that's going to grow and we're in a growth mode that we're interested in promoting the right kind of growth and that we're going to have, we want to have efforts to make sure that the growth is logical and, and smart. And so we're going to have staff and people advising us about, about that. And then the other thing that the council, I think, get, should get a lot of credit for is we continue the council has suggested that we are not going to just cut back our preventative maintenance and regular maintenance programs whenever we run into problems even if this will not be something that the residents see so a lot of underground infrastructure a lot of a lot of painting and and um roof repairs or re-roofing and things that are not necessarily things that the that the public will see uh, visible, but it's it's something that kind of maintains that long term infrastructure in the community. So we didn't just go in and cut all of our maintenance budgets by 50% to get to, to a magic number. We we've tried to maintain um, with only a few exceptions, the the pretty robust um, or very robust in some cases investments in infrastructure so that, that and you can see that in our enterprise funds, but also in, in our general fund areas, in, including buildings, vehicles, et cetera. So the, these are things when, when, we, when we were trying to make decisions about where can we cut or not cut, um, we tried to, tried to maintain these. Um, and then there's the underlying theme that, both on an outward and inward themes, the underlying is we want to keep investing in our people because we can't do what we do without them. And we want to minimize the service impacts on the public because there's no reason for us if we're not providing service to the public. So obviously I've got my three nice little screenshots, but we're always trying to remember both the resident and the employee in our decision making because you know what we do should be benefiting the residences and any decisions we make impacting employees impact everybody because they're delivering those services. So kind of where does the rubber hit the road? Where are we at? Basically, I was comfortable in proposing uh, what I consider to be a net levy of 0%. So we've experienced a lot of growth in the community. The benefit of that growth is that you've got new tax 
value that you can apply any increases to. And historically, the city has um, kind of budgeted to have net increases above zero. So both the new growth is paying new taxes, but also the existing residents are paying a little bit more each year to kind of keep the the fire going for all of these different projects, things like Glen Park and others that that take a lot of effort uh, financially. So we've seen both Pierce and St. Croix County growing. St. Croix County as a percentage is growing faster within the city of River Falls than Pierce County for values. Um, but essentially we, we're about a 1.98% increase in, in uh, net new construction. So that's the levy that we've proposed um, we'll talk a little bit about the the impact next. So, what does that mean? So, hey, Scott. Yes. This is John. Um, sure. There's a gray box on your screen. I sent you a message on how to maybe clear that up. Um, you do a Control Alt Shift. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Was it just a gray box, or did they see everybody? See nope. all the council members. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just the gray box. All right. Um, thanks, John. So, in in theory, and that we believe in practice, by setting the levy increase at that amount, it, you basically have a flat tax impact for the average taxpayer. So, what is the average taxpayer? Well, there's only one of them in town, right? Everybody else is either below or above average, so to speak, based on a bunch of statistical things. So we're in two two counties. We have tax and criminal financing districts that have some impact on the apportionment. We have equalization. We have a number of things, but essentially the average tax bill for, for the city portion in 2020 for a $200,000 home is about fourteen twenty six, and based on how this will be applied out, the average is going to be about 1403 in 2021. So there'll actually be a little bit of reduction because the assessed, assessed valuation is going to go up a little bit more than that 198 um, because of personal property and some other fairly mundane and boring technical stuff. But we wanted to be careful about this is essentially flat. Now, I will say if you're in Pierce County, you can expect that your taxes were a little bit higher than that and probably will could go up a little bit um if you're in st croix county your taxes might have been a little bit less than that and will go down a little bit um more than this because again we're in two counties and, and they're apportioning all that across um the two cities so um every taxpayer in town is not going to get a 23 dollar reduction in their taxes um, even if they had that that magic two hundred thousand or home, but this is illustrative. It kind of helps helps you understand where they're where what they're going to see on their property tax bill. Scott, we know what we're doing, and in the past we've had a little bit of indication from the school district and CVTC. Um, we 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 think we know what's going to happen at the counties by the by the looks of it. Any indication of the school district or? CVTC's plans for increase, decrease, or neutral? Um, we have some indication, but we haven't done the final chart, so to speak. So I believe the school district um, would have passed their budget already because they do a uh, July 1 fiscal, I think. Um, the counties are probably still, they would still, be on the basic calendar that we're on, and I'd, I actually can't speak for the CVTC because I'm not sure um, the, the exact timing CVTC does for theirs. But we'll we'll have that information likely by the time we come around for that first reading. We'll have an estimate, anyways. Okay. But it, it would be hard for me to predict at this point. Um, it, that's about what we do every year. Uh, council member is we're probably we're probably always a couple of three weeks later than when you'd like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I just you know it, we get we get out in public and 
and we hear from people, my taxes went up, my taxes went up, what are you doing, what are you doing? And then you get their bill and you show it to them and it's not typically us that is the big increaser that impacts most people. So no, it's under, always good under, to know where we're at. Understood, we're, we're gonna still be in that 29 to 30% range of the tax bill only. So there's another, you know, 70% of your taxes determined by other other boards and bodies. So what you could rightly ask, well, we told you what we wanted you to do in the fiscal plan. We all had a big discussion and agreed to kind of where we're going long-term with the city and our investment level and how we're gonna do it. So the fiscal plan had a target levy about three to 4% annually. The, the council has been increasingly, we've been putting more money into capital and infrastructure and that's allowed us to pull the borrowing back a little bit um and we continued we were planning to continue to do that um so gross levy in the in the plan was going to be about 3.81 percent and we thought that would be about a net of a three percent because we were expecting net new construction to be more like uh three quarters of a percent so net new construction is a little bit better than we th we had planned for in the fiscal plan and then we're our gross tax levy is is quite a bit less than what we had planned for, um, almost two per two percent or about half of what we expected. So we there again is just a reminder that we're expecting this to be about what is proposed, and obviously subject to council changing. What the proposal is is basically flat. Um, we've had some discussion internally and also with the council um, about how do we deal with capital improvement planning. The council received a plan for me that said, you know what, for 2020, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're not going to do. We're in the age of COVID and here's what I expect. And then council said, yep, that looks, that looks good to us. Um, we're going to come back in 2021 um, and do a five-year CIP plan. We're going to, um, Kind of figure out the next five years, but let's wait until 21. So what we've done is we've proposed essentially the first year of the 2021 multi-year plan within this budget. Um, there really isn't any surprises, I don't think, for the council about what's in or not. These are all things that we kind of talked about in our crushing COVID plan um, or have been approved since then by the council to go forward. For example, the improve, capital improvements related to the, the new TID um, around the housing development off of Division Street near DeSanctus. So we've got, um, typically we're just kind of grabbing the first year of a five-year approved plan or the first two years, I'm sorry, and sticking it in the two-year um, operating budget. In this case, we can only do really do that for 21. And then 22, we kind of put a placeholder in for borrowing um, that's not as precise as a list of projects. And then that'll give the council some flexibility when you have the discussion and, and policy debate in you know, May or June of 21 about how you wanna spend that money um, on what projects for 22. At the same time, you'll also be setting up 23, 24, and 25, um, potentially 26 projects for future councils. Um, enterprise funds, so obviously the $11 million general fund gets a lot of attention because it, it is essentially the, the driver of the tax levy because that's its primary, the general fund's primary resources is, is levy. Um, but it's, it is only about 25% of our overall budget each year. So we wanna make sure we talk a little bit about our, our enterprise funds, which are, are operated under more of a business fund uh, model. So profit and loss and balance sheet basis um, for the public good. So just a few highlights on those. Electric, um, they, we did do some re reductions in some expenditure areas. Um, we have assumed in our electric budget that we are going to have the possible closure of large customers 
And so we've assumed already a, a revenue reduction, and then we worked to that with the expenditure budget. So we've we've only budgeted expenditures to the extent that we'll have less revenue um, from those customers. Now, the benefit is the new rate structure is effective 928, so we're not talking about a net decrease in revenue overall. Um, there'll be an in, a slight increase in revenue as we go forward. So electric fund should be in really good condition um, by the end of, of 21, even if we sustain a closure of large customers, in particular UWRF and, and the River Falls School District. Wastewater is, is a fairly healthy enterprise fund. Uh, the larger capital spending is definitely uh, coming and continues to come. So we've made uh, tremendous investments there with um, solids handling and um, now in the clarifiers and uh, the mixing. And so we've, we're have we gonna continue to make more of those investments as we go forward with the North Interceptor in particular, and also the being able to abandon the South Fork lift station um, in conjunction with the the Highway 29 project that the state's doing. So that'll that'll remove a, a lift station and that part of this eventually will be then getting rid of two lift stations in the system and putting those on gravity, which is, which is much less costly to maintain and more reliable for us long-term. But that, those are very large expenses. Um, even with those expenses, um, wastewater is, is gonna be in good shape. Um, water is basically working off of a maintenance only schedule. So we're continuing to do um, some, some relining, reconstruction, repairs, um, valves and other things, but it's, we're not talking about a water tower or a booster station or anything like that in this, this cycle. Um, this cycle does include, um, I believe, and we'll, we could talk more about that in detail when we get into the, the bigger workshop and you have the budget book, but you'll see things like um, inspection of the reservoir. And, and when we say inspection in water, that always means, you know, drain everything, inspect it and then recode everything, you know, repaint it and and painting a reservoir or water tower, as you know, is is no little job and it's very expensive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stormwater has got a fairly healthy fund balance. Um, we've made a lot of investments in stormwater in the community. You, you can see those in every corner of the community. The major visible project for stormwater is going to be the Gulf View Channel improvement. We've continued to have issues there. That's the channel that goes um, essentially from the golf course kind of down through um, into the to the soccer fields, I guess, for lack of better explanation. Um, and that that's had some repeated damage through flooding events. And then lastly, on the enterprise, um, with the services being outsourced to Alina Health going forward, um, we are not expecting to use fund balance for 2021 and 22. By the end of 22, we expect to kind of be um, square with that fund. Uh, that fund's had some operating deficits, as you know, over the last couple of years, but we still do have some fund balance. We're gonna also have some revenue, excuse me. <coughs> Scott, do we know, do we have, or maybe Sarah, do we have a projection yet for how short EMS is going to be this year? We do. Um, obviously, it's still a projection, but I think roughly 300,000 short this year. Oh, that's 100 less than I heard last time. That's a good job. Thank you. It is. They've done a really nice job um, managing their expenses. Thank you. Yep. So... The last slide here is just to talk a little bit about next steps, but I do want to give, uh, before we do that, I want to give Sarah an opportunity. Um, if I breezed over something she had expected me to talk about and I didn't, or if she wants to um, emphasize anything here, Sarah. I think just a couple of things as it pertains to the 2020 actual results and the projections going forward. I just 
we give council a lot of credit for not making drastic decisions, but being thoughtful and mindful as we curbed our expenditures and that, yes, we had a range of what we thought the impact might be in terms of negative um, impacts to revenue, but it's looking better, you know, the low range of that, um, the lower end of that range. So just kudos to you guys for helping us steer it in a thoughtful, but not um, drastic way. So I think that's, that's proving to be really um, a good decision. I also think one of the things that we did do is we did reduce our street maintenance budget this year in order to help create that cost savings. And so what we have done, and you'll see this in the budget book details, we've bumped up the street maintenance a little bit over the next couple of years to make up for that um, reduction that we took this year. Otherwise, I don't have anything. I'm looking forward to sending you all the details and I'm happy to answer any questions or walk through the details. I think I think this is a fiscally conservative budget with a reasonable tax levy that doesn't sacrifice the services that we're going to provide. I'm happy so, to take any questions you might have. So I'm going to switch here hopefully and get the, the sharing off and get your faces all back here for everybody to see so you can have any discussion or question and answer that you'd like so so you may be saying well okay this is fine but you know where's the detail or how do we how do we get into that and and certainly the council has the ability to do that um we would advise you that you can have the most impact by telling us where we're wrong in broad themes or other big picture or if you think we've misinterpreted the direction that the council has 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 um, gone. Certainly the council has the ability um, and you'll be a better able to do that when you get the budget book and transmit a letter to go into any level of detail you, you choose to do so. So if you don't like the amount of supplies account for the fire department or for the finance department or, or, or the city administrator, you certainly can ask questions about how we arrived at those numbers and, and why we think it's something to do. Um, the budget workshop on 1020 is intended to give you kind of more free free reign, so to speak, to ask those kind of questions. I, in the next 15 to 20 minutes here before we, we break, I think about 615 is our, our tradition. I guess we'd be interested in feedback from the council um, regarding things that you might be surprised about or that you didn't hear covered that you would have expected to hear covered in a broad theme and and that will give us some idea of what to be prepared for um, going forward and certainly then I'd remind you all that that Sarah and I both are available um, in between <clears throat> these two workshops to to meet with talk with phone with video with about any anything you have that that that's on your mind, and it's also fine for the council to just show up on the 1020 workshop and kind of fire away. So we don't necessarily need to have big warning about anything, but it, certainly we can be best prepared if if you have broad thing themes that you're concerned about this evening, and then next at the next workshop um, things that you want to bring up. So that's that's kind of where we're at. Mayor, I, maybe I'll turn it back to you and you can decide how you want to proceed with Q&A. Broad spectrum ideas or concerns, now would be the time. Mr. Mayor. So if anybody wants to start, yep, go ahead. Yeah, I think, Mr. Scott, Mayor. generally from what I'm seeing in that transmittal letter, and then in the CIP, as we discussed in the past, everything is kind of in line with what you had talked about um, and, and picking my brain of what I was looking for. You know, I was generally uh, on board with that uh, net zero increase, um, but I, I think you addressed my concern um, that I had um, as one council member, as far as making sure that our services aren't impacted and our staff aren't impacted in a fashion that's gonna um, throw them kind of under the bus per se. Um, and leave them short staffed. Um, I think in the future years, I know during COVID, I think it's a great relief uh, for folks at home to know that, hey, we're doing the best that we can make a minimal impact on your family. 
but at the same point, um, I think in the future years here, we really, uh, maybe even next year, start looking at uh, um, filling some of those empty positions um, so we aren't um, being too heavy handed on our staff. Um, I know um, that's a hard token for some folks out in the public to say is, well, why do you have to add all these staff back? Well, um, we don't want to put too much burden on them either because these these are the folks that take care of us every day in our community and we got to spread that load out a little bit um, and i know looking at this uh transmittal sheet on uh, number seven it kind of talks about um the fte that we're short and i know we're filling a fire department we're recruiting for that now the ems is still obviously always ongoing um but i i'm, I'm really kind of would like to see that public safety positions um, that we have. I know we just had uh, Wes Adams uh, return from active duty. Welcome home, Wes. Glad you made it home. Um, that being said, um, I'd just like to reiterate looking at uh, filling some of those positions where they need to be next year. Mr. Mayor, if I could, yeah. I, I, a little bit of follow-up to Mr. Gagne's question. Um, Either officially or unofficially, we, we probably have some good idea, Scott, about retirements, planned retirements, or, or those types of things. And, and um, I'm, I'm looking for your feedback about key retirements or key um, replacements if we should lose, for instance, a, um, an electric lineman or something like that, that, that might be a key type of thing. Um, when you say hiring freeze, are you saying even with replacement or are you just talking about expanding the staff? I think you're talking about expanding the staff and not replacing positions that would become open. Is that, is that a fair statement or not? Um, well, no, when I say hiring freeze, I mean hiring freeze. So th that means that even if somebody retires, we would examine whether or not that we need, we wouldn't automatically fill that position that the freeze itself would would be just that it's frozen um and okay. then you'd be relying on the city administrator to decide if we want to thaw that particular um part of the freeze but if, <clears throat> to, so everybody's clear a freeze means with the exception of the community development position that i've outlined um you we would very carefully We'd be very careful about hiring back even re even retirements, and but you have the you have the same concern as the department heads. So I mean they're okay. They're doing some what ifs already too, and I'm saying, well, if that position were to come available, then you would provide an analysis of why it's urgent that we immediately fill that position in the context of whatever we're living at the time so certainly we would be looking at the circumstances and if not to pine too much on the individual positions but you know if we had three police officers all retire at the same time you know it's likely we would thaw the freeze and and go forward um but i even on alignment position it's difficult to see what the current workload and current economic environment that we wouldn't hire that position back right away but no the freeze the freeze does in fact mean nobody gets hired unless, okay unless it's approved by the city administrator okay um, and i got one other question if i could it's more about it's more about um laying out the the timing you know um when we look at the uh i just lost my slideshow here uh, when we look at the different plans that go into it, there's there's really, I mean, the comprehensive plan is a is a plan. I think that that we've got some direction that's going to start happening on. But the but the three plans that well, uh, the strategic plan is there. But the three plans that I always think about are the sort of the real key ones: um, the administrator's work plan, the fiscal plan, and the CIP budget. Um, you've mentioned already in in your in your discussion that CIP will kind of happen as part of the budgeting for this year and then we'll we'll see CIP work again next year. When are you when are we planning to get together and talk more about fiscal and your and the work plan? Yeah, fiscal plan I think 
We'll want to see kind of where the council comes down on the CIP first. Okay. And I guess it's not, I shouldn't put it that way because we've talked about this before. Some of this is circular, so it's chicken and egg. But yep. in, in my in my mind, I would like to see where the council is at on the CIP. I think we can provide, I think the current fiscal plan provides you enough framework to have a, a thoughtful discussion about CIP within that framework, even though obviously we've talked about it as being adjusted. I think you can go forward with the CIP and give us some thoughts um, and direction. And then fiscal plan probably is then a 2022 um, re revise. The administrator's work plan, I think people should understand that the budget as presented is, again, is not status quo. So we're not starving <coughs> our staff of resources but things are going to have to go a little bit slower. They're going to, the duration of the accomplishments is gonna take longer because we don't have as many hands on deck, so to speak. And the number and scope of, of aggressive projects or things that we all ag agree we like to do are gonna to have to be prioritized. So I don't see us doing work on the comp plan and the downtown plan and the man valley plan and in the past that might have been something we tried to do um but we don't have all those hands on deck and it's the same with the fiscal cip we may have tried to do the fiscal and the cip update all at the same time but we just we're simply not going to have the staff resources to do that um with what we budgeted for going forward um the same with on the enterprise funds we're not going to try to put up a new water tower and do the north sewer interceptor at the same time which in the past we might have tried to do those you know on similar paths but so when you get to the cip you you'll have some we'll have some decisions to make about how much resources staff wise and others we want to put in to kind of accelerate um some of these projects so the work plan minister's work plan is probably something I would present to the council in the late, this time or a little bit earlier this time next year. So after that CIP is done and we have a better idea where we're at with the COVID response. Um, and so you've kind of got the one year plan. So from me right now through the crushing COVID, um, kind of we made some adjustments to that. And then this budget is kind of putting your foot in the door on the administrator's work plan because this budget is kind of you're basically doubling down on the comp plan and saying that's really going to be our focus for kind of a major initiative, public input and multiple committees and the plan commission and the council kind of getting involved. Um, and then we have some pretty large infrastructure projects. So we'll be doing a lot of planning on Wasson, um, Powell Bridge and um, the North Interceptor. And then you'll actually start to see some construction on North Interceptor. Um, so that's that's what I see coming out of this budget as we as we propose. There's some flexibility that the council could could determine and wants to go forward and um, you know depending on our results with development and stuff, there might be even some some funding to to put back some of those positions. But I don't want anybody to get the impression that it'll be easy to. There, we are actually removing uh, vac we are unbudgeting vacant. FTE that we had planned to put in place. So you, I don't think the service result is going to be longer time to get your street plowed. You know, we're, we're not going to go from from a nine hour plow or an eight hour full plow to a 12 hour full plow. But we may see that um, instead of getting 20% of the city trimmed for boulevard trees, we're going to get 15% of the tr trees trimmed for a couple of years. Um, and, and so there there will be some service impacts. We've just tried to limit limit th those and we've tried to do it with a long-term view that you don't wanna have to be making it up later um, in a big way that's, that's not real easy to do. But we had originally planned, as all you remember, to add police officer, add a fire officer, to add a par another parks employee, um, there were, those were initiatives and strat, you know, priorities of the, the council to try to get some more effort in those areas. So proactive speed enforcement is, is not going to be a result of this 2021, 2022 budget. There isn't, 
you know, there isn't going to be additional effort in those areas um, given the resources that we're putting in place. Thank Mr. you. Plunkett. Mayor, a uh, couple of questions. Um, one regarding the street light utility fee, and as you had mentioned that this might be an item for future consideration, uh, I don't know how much to go into detail on that. Uh, and I apologize for not being entirely informed on the, the background of this. Uh, it's my understanding that that fee was put in place so that taxpayers are not subsidizing uh, non tax paying institutions on uh, their use of resources. Uh, what dollar amount are we talking about there that that's expected to bring in that we're not bringing in um, would be the first question. Uh, and then the second one is that as we, we look at the CPI, uh, the consumer price index, and you know, I know that it's slightly different for, for businesses and institutions. Um, we continue to see an increase in the cost of things to people. Um, how many years have we done? Just give me an average for, let's say, the last 10 years, uh, a net new uh, levy of zero. Um, and how is that going to impact the city's ability to function going forward? as we look at the continued actual decrease in real dollars that we're able to work with. Thank you. Sure, sure. I think I can answer those briefly and then we can elaborate maybe um, at another time or in the other the next workshop. But Streetlight Utility, if I recall, is about 200,000 in, in real dollars and gross dollars um, in revenue that would be collected. Um, and yes, I think in a uh, simplistic way, the fee was adopted by the council with the thought that it was a more equitable way to collect. It was more associated with the users and the benefit, you know, the benefiters and the and the payers. Whereas the current system, paying the lights through the property tax, primarily puts the burden on on the residential property owners. Um, whereas nonprofits. Uh, non tax tax exempt properties um, wouldn't be paying so um, that there's a whole whole discussion out there actually uh, council member Plunkett, we could probably find some council workshops or other links that could could bring you up to speed on that because I, I it's been an on and off again conversation by city councils for probably seven years I think um, and CPI that yeah, CPI, we shouldn't fool ourselves to think that if we do net zero this year, at some point, there will be more pressure on us to do more than the CPI increase in taxes in order to try to pay for the the kind of the revenue that we didn't collect, so to speak, before. But um, even knowing that, I think this is a reasonable proposal for the council. It's one that I thought about and, and we concern... In our fiscal planning, we definitely concerned ourselves over that. I think those of you who were part of any of those fiscal plan discussions, you know, we really saw that, you know, expenses for things that you buy, um, maybe more so on the enterprise funds um, than on the general fund. But, you know, asphalt keeps going up and pipe costs go up. And, and so you, if you don't either get more efficient somehow, which is a possibility, but certainly I don't think efficiency alone can keep up with inflation, but you do have to get those. So I don't think we're just unnecessarily delaying the inevitable with this budget. I wouldn't have proposed it if that's what I thought, but it certainly is a, it certainly is a question. In particular, street maintenance is one that um, we think warrants uh, a separate analysis we, that we need to really take a look at our street maintenance again it's been about seven or eight years since we did a pretty comprehensive study of, okay, how have construction costs gone and how many lane miles are we getting done and what percentage of the street, you know, are we expecting our streets to be 80 years old before we, we give up on them or 60? And, and so that's, we're due for that analysis. Again, um, I think we're okay um, going into the, 
2021-22 budget with these very, what I consider to be modest increases because we also looked at doing an actual zero. I mean, and and when we talked about a gross, basically holding the levy exactly the same, then I really did have some concerns when you started running the numbers about you just really can't keep up with the expenses um, unless you're willing to make some some service service cuts. Um, and if you are, then then you're 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 keeping up with the expense increases in some service areas by eliminating expenses on other service areas, but it has a service impact. So I didn't get the impression from council that you were, that there was a commitment to actually eliminate certain services that we have now in order to to allow us to kind of reduce the taxes to to keep up pace for other things. I don't know if that's that's a long winded way of saying. I think we'll be okay for twenty one. Inflation looks like we can do it. We've also had some reductions in things that we spend a lot on, like fuel and utilities and things. So. Um, you know whether natural gas and fuel prices will hold low i don't know um but there's been in we're not if we were building houses i would i'd probably not be proposing this kind of increase because materials are going up much faster than that Does that answer the question kind of <laughs> okay mr mayor i have a question yep go ahead mr Downing. Uh, Mr. Simpson, when you looked at the capital improvement plan, um, how did you come to the determination of a project like the North Sewer Interceptor project as far as uh, the timeline and um, implementing an essential service with the, the budget you're looking at? Sure. So that one is might be the easiest one for me to, to answer because that's had, I think that project has had the most scrutiny personally by me maybe to the annoyance of staff at this point, but um, we have gone through several iterations of specific conversations about the scope and timing and could we delay and how would we delay and what would be the impacts of delaying on both our system capacity. So in other words, how could we do this? How could we provide the services to the public, but also on staff resources, like do we have enough people to get these projects done and, and wouldn't it be nice if we could move things back a few years so that we have a little more time? So the North Interceptor, a combination of capacity, um, the amount of money we have into design already, and the and the fact that we would lose some of that captured cost if we if we delay a project that we've half designed, you end up having to almost redesign it, and then your design costs are really a problem. So in a project like North Interceptor, you're, we're already a half a million into design. So you don't, you you want to be very careful about delaying, delaying the project to the point where you have to spend that money again on design. Um, and then also we have some timing on our easements that we've acquired for that North Interceptor project. And you have the opportunity costs that if you do delay that beyond the easements, then you have to renegotiate all your easements, um, which is also can be a pretty costly and and not a great great use of our time. So for the North Interceptor, that was a pretty easy one to come to as far as we need to do something, but we've actually scoped it differently than what was in the original capital plan. So I expect we'll bid um and go out for construction on a phased approach and we'll do about half of the project in 21 and then the second half of the project will likely be in 25 or 26 and the 25 or 26 number is basically how long we can reasonably push it without getting ourselves in trouble on a service capacity issue meaning you know how long can you count on that lift station and the size of the pipes you have to to serve you so it may be that the utility advisory board and the council decide next year after we get the bids in that they'd like to push forward with that, the whole project and just get it done with. Um, but right now your finance director and I think it's not prudent to, we'd like to spread that extra $2 million in that second phase out, out down the line because it, it helps a lot with our debt service um, and a limit the impact on ratepayers. Mr. Simpson, one last question. Um, 
there was a grant that came um, for part of that project for cleaning up uh, um, a little, an area of water that was, yep. um, is the that pond. underway or is that going to be scheduled into the future? Yeah, I think the, the recommendation at this point on that particular project is to go with a minimalistic um, improvement project rather than um, what has now become almost a $1 million um, <laughs> project. And so we are likely to return the grant to the DNR because it's, it's, it's woefully inadequate to match um, in the way that we thought it would when we originally accepted the grant. So I, I'll be recommending um, or instru instructing staff that we should um, pull back on that one. So we'll be, we will be doing a pond improvement project as part of this this overall, but it, it will be more like a $200,000 pond than a $900,000 pond at this point. So will we be looking at putting that into the future, say 2023 or somewhere in there? And um, Yeah, ab absolutely. No, there's definitely merit in doing the project, but there's no urgency from a design standpoint to have to do it today. Um, and frankly, the grant opportunity is likely to be available to us in the future. Um, because and it'll be more expensive of a project and so frankly the grant match will be the same percentage but maybe a larger grant so we'll see how that that comes through but we're we're always cognizant of the ratepayer impact you know we at, we need to do the projects that we need to do but the question is what's the timing because we want to wait in some cases to to let the debt service fall off for some projects before we have another ones to, to limit the impact because everybody pays the stormwater fee too. Correct. All right. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Okay. Should we, Mr. Mayor, should we take, yeah. One quick question for Scott. Um, how is the Powell Falls Dam uh, impacting our budget going forward? Um, do we have money set aside? For that removal based on any kind of revenues is there any grant money that's come forward uh, have we raised any money through the kinney cc for any dam removal that might come sooner than expected or repair yeah the short answer is from a budget standpoint we have included the assumption that there will be a large percentage of the ultimate removal paid for through um, donations and grants so um, at this point, we haven't had, other than the, the regulatory expenses, we haven't had a lot of expenses related to the, to the design or construct or deconstruction costs, so to speak, nor have we seen a significant third party fundraise. So we, we neither have the expenses yet, nor, nor have we got the, the revenue. Um, Sarah, do you recall what we had in there for her? For an amount, I think we have like 1.9, or, or am I thinking of the wrong number for? Let me pull it up here in one sec. 1.6. Yeah, 1.6. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, in other words, it's going to be in. We expect that to be in the, the capital planning session to kind of decide how much we should set aside, utility revenue versus funding. I think it's 50-50 right now. Yeah, so we have 1.6 exactly to Mr. Gagne's point in the CIP right now that's showing the expenditures from 21 through 25. And that's not inclusive of, I believe, all of the expenditures. I believe that there's additional amounts expected to be spent in 26 as well. The way that we're showing the split right now is half paid by the utility and then half paid by grant funds or fundraised funds. And Sarah, there is money in 21 and 22. There's 75,000 in 21. That's funded by the electric utility in the CIP. So if for some reason we have to come and remove that, we do have that money funded um, to at least remove the dam potentially, not maybe not including a lot of restoration at that point and beautification. Well, to, to be clear, we, we have it in our projected CIP but it's not, we do not have the funds budgeted in 21 or 22. We're not proposing to budget the right. funds for the actual removal. We're, we are still sticking with the original timetable that we had. Um, so we're, these are more 
study costs and design costs, um, not actual, I guess, keep thinking of construction, but it's deconstruction cost. It's a little so, further. I guess my clarification there, if I could, um, what if we have another seven foot, six foot uh, flood over that dam and it blows out that side? Um, uh, what, what, I mean, I, I guess, what is the time frame? Um, I know we're talking about budget here um, and not necessarily the Paula Falls Dam, but what what is the timeline as far as knowing what we're going to have to do there as far as repair or remove early, um, not just for the dam, but for the safety of people and for the river and everything else that goes along with it? Yeah, for, <clears throat> I, I would say we do not have concern. We don't have any additional concern for health, welfare, and safety issues of the dam. So the, the dam inspection we're doing now is not necessarily because there's concern that it's going to breach and cause loss of life or something. It was essentially to get a better idea of if we want to continue generating electricity, what would be required. So I think I think we'll be in a better shape within a month of knowing kind of where we're at with that. Um, we won't have any more precise removal cost estimates for at least I'd say 12 months. So we're, we're, we're pretty early still in that hydro relicensing process. And then we have to go through a number of stakeholder discussions and things related to, you know, what is the final budget? Is it going to be 1.9, 1.6? What's, what's included? And then where does the money come from? But you're probably, that's, probably something you'll have a lot more information for the 23 24 budget um not necessarily um much better information in the short term but we're we're not anticipating that all of a sudden the dnr is going to or the FERC for that matter is going to say as a result of a inspection you need to remove the dam immediately that's that's seems to be far from everyone's reality including FERC and the dnr at this point um Thank you. If people have more questions, send them to Scott and Sarah, and we can kind of work on this and then get deeper into it next week. Yeah, Is these everybody are really, okay. Yeah, I really appreciate the questions. We're, and we like to talk about budgets. So, it, you know, you can, we don't get. That's all I do. We're spending all my time. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. We appreciate everything you've done to get us to this point through all this COVID and getting everything ready for the budget for next next couple of years. You've done a great job. So, Mr. Mayor, yeah, do we stay just in this uh, meeting for the council meeting? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So, are you but we'll take we'll take what do we got? We'll take about ten minutes here. Right. So you can mute and uh, drop your video, but stay on. Thank you.
Hi, Beth. This is John Smith. Hi, John. Let me change you to a presenter. Okay. And then you're muted and all that, right? That's you. Three, two, three. Okay. Video. There you are. All right. There I am. I am. Yeah. So the video should work. I'll have a few minutes, but it is being streamed and recorded. So. Okay. Um, and let's see. Attendees. Everybody else is on just a few minute break here from. Yeah, I heard. I, I logged on a couple minutes ago and I heard him. Nice. Going to break. So, and yep. Chancellor Foster will be joining from her computer in just a second, too. So, sounds great. All right. So, we will continue to take a few minute break and um, just the agenda is, you know, call the meeting to order, the Pledge of Allegiance, roll call, minutes, bills, public comment, which there may be, there are a couple folks here. And then, um, then you're up after that. Okay, so someone will introduce the chancellor and, and kind of give me the cue to go ahead and start Perfect. sharing my screen. Yep, that'll be the mayor. Perfect. Dan. Yep. All right. All righty. Thank and, you. And um, it just take your time and you know get your screen set up. Uh, it's all part of the drill. We all understand that <laughs> things can flop <laughs> like a fish sometimes. Yeah, and, um, you know how it goes. So <laughs> I know with with PowerPoint or, uh, on WebEx, inevitably it yeah. shares the presenter view right. first, yeah. and then you have to flip over to the actual <laughs> slides. I don't know why it does that. Yeah. <laughs> You'd think so the programs all... would talk to each other nicely, but they seem to yeah. not want to. It's all good. So all right, we'll sit back, relax, get a cup of water or something, and yep. we'll be going Go in a few minutes. All right, thanks. See you soon. Yep. Hey, John, quick question. Yeah. Hey, is there a way to turn on backgrounds in settings? Um, you can. Um, can. It has to be an admin. The admin has to approve uh, the person to be able to do it, and I can't see it. I've actually followed a lot of the tutorials online. It says something about an admin. Admin has to approve it. That would be me. Um, Which background do you want, Chris? So to like do my own background, do, do a blur or anything like that. On an Sean iPhone. just told me that if you push the start video, stop video button a couple times, you'll get background come up. Oh, virtual background, yeah. Oh, geez. So then, yeah. just to warn you, it yep. can uh, draw on resources. So if your Wi-Fi is a little weak, or you know you're running underpowered on your okay. device. Uh, One that gig can One gig. Um, impact how things work. One gig Xfinity internet. All right. Well, I'm, I've got a little bit of work to do here, so I'm going to step so. away for a sec. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sean and Scott, for the tip.
<clears throat> Just testing. Can you guys hear me? Thanks. Hey, uh, uh, sorry for that last meeting. I didn't mean to hurry everybody off there. I got a cramp in my calf. I had to, I had to jump up and yell and scream outside for a couple of minutes. Sorry, I didn't mean to rush anybody off. <laughs> no, I had to go grab something to eat too. So, thanks for doing that. Yeah. Christy had Steve's pizza delivered to my house. What? Yeah. Christy, Same used... favoritism. Yep. Yeah. Suck up. Wait a minute. <laughs> yep. Is it? it John, is. whenever you're ready. It's 1832, so uh, we are recording. We're streaming. It's all your show. Okay. Well, I'd like to walk in, welcome everybody to the October 13th Rural Falls City Council meeting. The first thing we'll do is say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag to the of the United States, United of, America. States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands. stands. One, One nation, nation under God, God, God indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. all. Okay, then Christy, can we please have a roll call? Sure. Mr. Beerstead. Here. Stoney. Here. Gagne. Here. Morissette. Here. Odine. Here. Plunkett. Here. Watson. Here. Thank you. Okay, next we have approval of the minutes from the September 22nd meeting. I move approval. Second. First and second, any questions or comments on the minutes? Christy, can we get a roll call for the minutes? Yes, a first by Mr. Morissette, second by Downing to approve the minutes. Start with Mr. Plunkett for the vote. Aye. Aye. Watson. Aye. Gagne. Aye. Morissette. Aye. Doning. Aye. Beerstead. Aye. Thank you. Okay, next we move on to approval of the bills with Mr. Watson. Mr. Mayor and Council, I move for the approval of the bills in the amount of $2,692,336.55. Subject to the Comptroller. Second. Okay, we have first and second. Christy, can we have a vote, please? First by Mr. Watson, a second by Mr. Beer said to approve the bills. Let's start with Ms. Odine on the vote. Aye. Downing? Aye. Morissette? Aye. Gagne? Aye. Watson? Aye. Beerstead? Aye. Plunkett? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next move on to public comments. Uh, do we, is there anybody at City Hall, John? Or yes, Jason? there is. We have a couple folks here. Okay. Uh, we'll bring them up one at a time and they can introduce themselves and state their piece. Just a sec. Members first. Okay. Get your name and your address, please. Hi, my name is Patricia LaRue. I live at 489 Marcella Court. And um, in case anyone didn't know, there's an election coming up. I've been an election official for over 12 years now, and I just thought I wanted to um, update people on, on where we're at. The, I'll make this quick, though. The online deadline has already passed to register. You can register in per person before election day at the city hall. The deadline for that is October 29th. That's a Thursday at five o'clock. Um, you can register in person on election day, but I strongly suggest that you try to get registered ahead of time because we are gonna have a crowd and we just would soon like to get people through the lines and out the door as quickly as possible. Um, mail-in ballots, you can request your mail-in ballot now um, but you should, even though they say the deadline to turn that in is like a week before election day, I strongly suggest there that you, as soon as you know who you're going to vote, you mail it in. 
Um, there's no guarantees when it was going when it would get here. However, the better plan is if you've got a mail in ballot, the city hall does have secured boxes outside and in the lobby that if you want to, while you're driving by, just drop your ballot off and then, you know, we've received it. Um, you can vote um, absentee in person from October 20th through the 30th. That's not a guarantee there won't be lines, but it might be an easier time. We even have hours on Saturday, the 24th from 10 o'clock till two o'clock. Then if everything happens, election day, we will register. You can vote. Um, we, ex we hope that you're patient with us. We're very prepared uh, to enforce masking, six feet distancing, um, sanitizing. We're gonna ask people to wear masks and we just ask that you prepare to wait. And the final thing is, is we have a touch screen system that is, is uh, scares people off because they think that these touch screens can be messed with. But I will say that if you use the touch screen, you can't go wrong because the screen will not go forward if you've made a mistake. And when you're done and you submit your vote, there's, there's a written piece of tape that says what you voted for. You look at that, you make sure it's right, you submit your ballot and it goes around in a spool on paper. So it's not like it goes into the atmosphere somewhere. It's on paper. When that spool is taken out, three people have to sign it. It goes into a bag with a not tamper proof um, clip. So the fact that you're voting electronically or touch screen does not mean that someone can tamper with your vote. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Ms. LaRue for the update. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. There is someone else. Okay. Hi, I'm Diana Smith from the Town of River Falls, and I'm here for the public hearing on the ETZ review of 1610. Okay. Anybody else, John? Uh, let me let me ask. Thank you. I'm uh, Jerome Roadwald, zoning administrator for the Town of River Falls. I'm here to uh, attend the pub public hearing on. Chapter 16.10. Anybody else, John? Nope, that's it. Okay, and we have no nobody online. That's correct. Okay. So next we'll move on to we'll have a little update from um, University of River Falls. Uh, Chancellor County Foster and Chief of Staff Beth Schomer are both here to give us a little presentation. Thank you, guys. Yeah, hello. Hello, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting us to uh, update you on what we're doing at UW River Falls. Um, first of all, I'm Connie Foster. I'm serving as interim chancellor. Um, and my chief of staff, Beth Schomer, is going to be running the PowerPoint and also can answer questions that we uh, will be happy to take at the end. So, I um, want to provide an update on our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we want to let you know um, what we've done since the start of the semester. There we go. All right. So, um, at the start of the semester, well, actually summer, I started July 1, uh, we've been focusing on this concept of community of care, uh, that we're all in this together. Um, we required mandatory face coverings prior to that being required uh, in the city. Uh, we strict social distancing. We have a nine foot distance between students and all of our classrooms and labs. Two thirds of our classes are online or hybrid, or they were. That was uh, looking back to uh, the start of the semester. Um, we took a lot of time to educate students on risk and their responsibilities. However, um, the week of September 14th, uh, we're doing testing, a lot of testing on campus uh, of residence hall students and all students. But anyway, we saw a sudden spike in co cases, positive cases, um, in which we wanted to declare at that time, uh, it was it was uh, more than we could handle, a two-week shelter in place and an online-only course delivery, uh, which we did for two weeks. Based on that, we definitely saw a drop in the number of our positive cases, and at the same time, uh, due to the the implementation of some plans. So when the cases spiked, 
Uh, again, shelter in place and all online and telecommuting for the majority of our employees. We've now implemented mandatory testing for residence hall students every two weeks. Testing still available for all students. We are encouraging our off campus students to come in and get tested. We have enough tests to test them. Certainly any student with symptoms needs to come in and must get tested. We've doubled and in some cases tripled our contact contact tracing and case management teams. Um, we've reassigned um, about 60 uh, UW RF staff to help us with a number of things for everything from organizing volunteers to doing intake, disease investigation, contact tracing, um, and quarantine and isolation. One of our problems when we had the spike in cases was we we um, we almost we, we did manage to find enough places to house students who had tested positive, but it was very last minute and hectic. So since that time, we've emptied out one of our dorms, Stratton Hall, and it's now uh, going to be used as an isolation area. It can accommodate up to approximately 180 students. Um, on the next slide, you'll see, uh, yeah, right now, okay, nearly 80% of our courses are online or online option. It is a little confusing. One thing we learned with the two weeks moving to online is our faculty, to all online, our faculty that were teaching face-to-face -face now had to shift their methodology and pedagogy to an online format. So we've encouraged um, faculty to have the option of online, even if they are still meeting face-to-face. -face. So some students can still opt to go online. For, whereas once it was only a face-to-face -face offering. The other thing we've done is de-densify our residence halls. Um, a number of students who's realizing that they have all face-to-face -face classes have asked to um, be removed from their residence hall contracts and we've let them do that. So we don't have as many students in our residence halls. Um, we've been allowing telecommuting when possible or we did doing shelter in place. Uh, we still allow a lot of a lot of telecommuting, but all of our student service offices remain staffed and open. Um, um, the other thing that we've really been trying to work on is more communication and education for our students. I do think that going to the shelter in place and all online definitely caught their attention. We've seen a very strong drop in our number of positive cases over the last, it's been four weeks now, so two weeks of shelter in place and our cases are still quite low, even though we've returned to quasi-normal operations. Um, I think the students are understanding more the science behind the virus. Um, and particularly, um, we, have, um, we have communicated that we would take disciplinary sanctions for those who would violate public health guidelines. Um, we've also encouraged um, off-campus student responsibility. So we will test students once every two weeks, no matter where they live. If they want to step forward, we can put them in our system. Um, on the next slide, you'll see, um, well, okay, and we cannot succeed alone, obviously. The governor's emer uh, recent emergency order number three of limiting uh, the numbers that are allowed in group gatherings. The, the one thing that we learned from our students and having to move to shelter in place and now coming off of it is that it is really those large group gatherings. And um, our students, of course, um, probably got in trouble for attending some back to school parties and that early Labor Day weekend is what we attribute some of those outbreaks to. But I have to say that any large group um, that aren't physically distanced and masked is just a breeding ground for COVID-19. And I think our students are realizing that we're actually more worried about people going to weddings or other uh, bars where there's not um, masks or any, any precautions being taken. Those, that is where you're gonna see a spike in cases. So. We really tried to educate our students on that. Unfortunately, it does impact some of our small businesses now because they're limited to the numbers they can bring in. But it does help provide a safe environment for all of us um, and our, obviously our off-campus students, but I would say for all of us in the community. Um, I think that this, alone, this will be a, another big factor in helping us avoid another spike. Um, so yeah, we do need to work together on this. Here's some data uh, with also the website for our dashboard. Um, the dashboard has, you know, the also has the number of test um, cases of test results we received that day and the number that were positive. And fortunately, for the last four weeks, we've, we've dropped quite low. 
Um, we've been testing between one and 250 students, and we've seldom had over three a day, only seeing one, two, or three a day. So I don't know if we can maintain that low of a positivity rate, but I would like to think we might. So um, you can see the drop in some of these, the active cases. Obviously, we have an active case for two weeks once they've tested positive, or uh, we're in a close contact and have to quarantine. Um, so yeah, that, um, so why are we doing this? Sometimes I ask myself that, why are we doing this? <laughs> it has not been easy. Like I said, we've had um, so many people involved in, in trying to um, keep us moving forward during the time of COVID-19, of trying to be there for our students, but also knowing we can't, we just can't do everything. But our educational mission, uh, not all of our teaching can be delivered online. A number of students don't learn so well online. We're trying to offer some of that face-to-face -face contact. Obviously, our lab farm, our science, technology, engineering, math type courses need that um, that face-to-face. -face. Our creative arts need some face-to-face -face components. Um, and not every business is struggling right now, although I know so many are. Um, but our our students are still um, around, I guess I should say, and hopefully um helping helping some of the local businesses um in their quest to stay open um students and employees need us to continue to educate we had a very successful college virtual fair with 119 employers employers present um i think that you know we are doing career services um, we have all of, we have so many things online a student a student could participate uh quite well and, and get all the online functions if they if they want and some do because uh, they have situations at home that they don't want to bring the virus back to, but others want to be with us. They want to be in the residence halls. They want to try to go to their face-to-face -face classes. Usually, whenever we make a new policy decision and communicate it, I hear from both ends of the spectrum. You know, a parent and a student are mad because their face-to-face -face class is moving online. Another student wants to get out of their face-to-face -face class to move online. Um, so it's just it's hard to predict. Um, the economic impact on UW River Falls and the city of, of River Falls. So I think um, obviously UW River Falls is part of the economic vitality of the city in this region. Um, the cost of completely remote option um, for one or two more semesters, um, kind of like we did last spring, it was just the complete lockdown because of the shelter, shelter at home ruling. We really, um, you know, all the dorms were closed, all the residence halls, the uh, food service, no meals, everything. And the place was locked up. When I started July 1, I needed a special card to get into my office. Um, we were just locked up and, and we really couldn't do that too much longer without huge layoffs. And um, the impact would be, um, it would be felt everywhere. And obviously we wouldn't have um, the students visiting our local economies in Main Street, which has been hurt because they're not coming for the sporting events or the music concerts or any other events. So they're not staying in the hotels as much. We do appreciate being working with the hotels to help us for some of our quarantine students. And that's at least been a little bit of a business partnership that we've had with the hotels in town. We appreciate that. Um, but at least we do have some students milling around, um, kind of keeping things going uh, at some level is much better than totally shutting down. Um, as long as we can, all, as long as we can keep our safety precautions and public health recommendations um, at forefront, I feel I feel confident we can continue to do so. But the minute we don't do that, then we, we all get in trouble. Uh, let's see. Next slide. So let's do our part. River Falls. We reached out with others, um, with you all, with, with representatives from City Council, from Peter. Uh, Chippewa, Chippewa Valley Technical College. Obviously, we work closely with Pierce County and St. Clair County Public Health. Um, we appreciate all their help. It's been a tough time for them as well. So um, we appreciate our partnerships. We want to be um, seen as as uh, community partners. Um, so we thank you for your kind of opportunity to let me share our story of kind of where we started and where we went and where we're heading. Um, I will say we're thinking our spring semester will look a lot like fall. Um, that's what we're seeing. We don't see the virus stopping uh, soon enough or vaccine develop soon enough and distributed that will really change our, 
our spring semester, it'll probably look pretty similar the way it does now, unless well, there's a lot of other variables we can't control, but that's what we're seeing. So, so with that, I'd be happy to answer some questions. Um, I've got okay. a question, Connie. I've got two, actually, if I could. First of all, <laughs> it's great seeing you again. I, uh, um, I, I miss seeing you at Rotary and some other things, so it's, it's good to have you back in, at, the, at, at the helm. But um, you mentioned testing. Uh, is that mandatory testing or is that volunteer? And what's the percentage of participation you're getting from that testing? Yeah, great question. Well, when, when I stepped in in July 1, we were thinking we were trying to do a partnership with Vibrant Health to do our testing, which they, they just wouldn't have the capacity. We ended up going with Wheeler Health Logistics out of La Crosse, which actually we had them first, and now they're at three other UW institutions. They're just excellent in Hagstead Hall. They've come and set the whole testing room. We can test up to um, 250, possibly 275. If we stay open later at night, maybe 300 students a day. That's the max we can test. So we originally um, took the stance that we um, we weren't going to make it mandatory we and encourage them to go. Well, that that did not serve us well. Uh, we weren't getting enough of them in there. So as soon as we went to shelter in place, we said from now on, it's mandatory. If you live in the residence halls, it's mandatory that you go in once every other week to get tested. Um, the other thing we've done is encourage our off campus students to come in. And like I said, especially those that are working in environments with vulnerable populations, group homes, senior living situations. Um, and also in, in maybe uh, bar settings that are not safe. A lot of our students, some of our students work in the bartending business. So we've really talked to them about that. We've gotten emails from them saying, should I go to work? And when I hear it's in a bar, I go, I really don't think you should, but I know you need the money. So think about this, talk to your supervisor. So um, like for the group homes, um, we're trying to get the word out that are uh, the senior living that if the supervisors wanna require that they get tested, we can, we can do that. So if you have a student working for you and you want them to get tested, that's send them our way. We would like to do that. Is so that Connie, yeah. yeah, any any percentages? Any um... well, percentages of students getting tested? Well, um, you know, we're only required we only have originally there's two types of tests as you we're all becoming testing experts, right? The yep. PCR tests, which which are about a hundred dollars a shot and are uh, a little more accurate, and then the antigen tests, which you can use to testing congregate living situations such as residence halls or senior living where people are sharing bathrooms or living in the same hallway that's called a congregate living situation mm -hmm. and for that you can use antigen testing because it's a lot cheaper and you get the results in, in 20 minutes so if someone tests positive then it's like okay but we've now learned that the antigen tests tend to have false positives which might have been part of our spike problem so now when you get an antigen test and it's positive you're automatically quarantined and you get a PCR test, which takes anywhere from 24 to 72 hours to get back. And then you're quarantined until you get that PCR test back. So, um, but percentages, we originally had about 2,300 in our residence life. So that's how many we'd want to test. We have about 5,800 students total. So it's not, it's, it, and now we've dropped to about 1,800 residence hall students. So we're not testing, I don't know, what, what 30, maybe uh, not even half, not even half our students are in the residence halls. Now, other students can get tested in their own counties. We have students that live in Minnesota. We have students that live all over the place. Um, we're a border institution, we're a residence and commuter type school. And a number of them do get tested elsewhere because we see their test results if they share them with us, which most of them do. But yeah, that's we're not testing off campus students. I mean, they're okay. not required. Only congregate living residents sure. students are required, mandatory. And maybe maybe I missed this in your in your opening remarks, but has there been any impact or or has there been any revisiting the the time frame for the science building? Uh, no, it's still on schedule. Uh, great question. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Science uh, and Technology Innovation Center is um, moved into the 21-23 biennium for construction funds. Um, the system, UW system, is asking for $1.2 billion in construction funding um, for projects throughout the UW system, both um, big projects and ours as a capital project. 
So we're number 16 on the list, um, which is not quite in the middle, a little below the middle, but um, we're on the list and that's the good news. And we're still uh, working hard to keep that building moving forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, other Any, anybody else? Yeah. yeah, Mr. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Chancellor Foster, for the update. I appreciate your recognizing that the Wisconsin idea is a two-sided coin. It's not just the beneficial influences of the university, but also the COVID that can influence the campus and vice versa, that what is happening with the community load of cases uh, can come back and negatively impact you on campus. And I apologize uh, that we're all dealing with that situation. Nobody likes it. Um, you had said we had about 1,800 students remaining uh, in the residence halls now after the drawdown. How does that compare to how many we started with there? Yeah, and I'm and Beth, if you know exact answers, jump in. I'll give you my my knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think we usually have somewhere around 2,300 to 2,500 if we filled if we were at okay. capacity and we started at about 86% capacity in starting the school year. And now we've dropped to 80, and I think we're going to drop more. Um, I think I don't know what it'll look like, but. Um, I, I asked this morning on a call and I was told we're somewhere around 1800, but I think that's dropping. I think we're going to drop to at least 1700. Beth, do you hear any more on that? Yeah, no, that's, that's accurate. Those are the numbers that I have too. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, and then what are we seeing? Case to the positive tests that you've seen. Uh, what are we seeing uh, in on campus versus off campus students in that aspect? You know, I'd love to, if we were testing more off campus, I would, I don't have, we, we test so few off campus. Oh, although, so that's wow. That's why. So, however, the good news is I was encouraged by the <laughs> operating manager of kind of overseeing our operations has said that we're starting to see more off campus students voluntarily come in. We just saw, a, uh, so hopefully that will continue. We, we've done a lot of communication to them, encouraging them to do so. Yeah, Beth. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. We have not seen um, many cases of transmission from the classroom setting. So we're very reassured by that. Um, we know that the precautions we put in place in our in instructional spaces have been working. Um, so the transmission that we saw has either been linked to the congregate living settings or to you know off-campus exposures that we don't that we're not aware of and we have no control over. Right. That's a difficult situation to. Uh, with many aspects to to consider there. I appreciate your guys work on it. Uh, the last one for just informational purposes uh, of the antigen testing that you're seeing positive. Uh, what percent are we seeing confirmed in the uh, PCR follow up? That's a great question. Betsy. Um... Um, I don't know the answer though. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure because the, the guidance from um, Wisconsin Department of Health recently changed on what number of antigen tests actually had to be reflexed to PCR or not what number, what categories of antigen tests. Um, so we've had to now reflex nearly every antigen test to PCR except for um, antigen negative asymptomatic results. So anything else has to just get verified by PCR. Um, so that's going to change the numbers. And we just instated that change in the last um, couple of weeks as we returned from shelter in place. So I don't know what the um, so, what the uh, correspondence is between those two right now. So we don't have a breakdown essentially of which of the follow-up PCR have been done because of a positive antigen and which have been done because of a symptomatic negative antigen. Exactly. We have that data, but I, I don't know what no, the breakdown is right now. now. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. That that's uh, I appreciate the information. I think that it helps uh, all of us have a better understanding of what's going on, and I uh, appreciate your work on this and hope that we can all do well and doing our best to work on crisis management. <laughs> yeah, thank you. 
other other questions or thoughts or any other questions from council? No. Okay. Well, thanks, Chancellor Foster, and uh, we appreciate all your guys' help over there. You're a great uh, a great asset to the community, that's for sure. So. We'll keep working on this. Yeah, Thank thanks, you very much. Yeah, thanks for having us. We we yep. definitely want to work with the community, and we just we keep telling our students the same thing. We're all in this together. We all need to be together. So thank you yep. so much. Thank you all thanks. very much. Just see some thank familiar you. faces, Scott, Diane. <laughs> thank you. Good. Night. Have a good night, guys. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Let's move on. First thing we'll do is we're gonna we're gonna close the council hearing and open up a public hearing on ordinance number 2020-08 to rezone and amend future land use map for South Wisconsin uh, South Wasan Lane Lot One. Uh, this is a second reading and disposition, and uh, this would change the ordinance to amend the future land use map for South Wasan from R1 single family low density to R2 multiple family medium density residential. And Sam's there for any questions. Is there anybody in the audience has anything like to say about this? John, anybody have anything at City Hall they wanna say? Uh, no. Okay, so I'll close the public hearing and open up the council hearing and I'll take a motion on this. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion we approve ordinance number 2020-08, rezoning and amending future land use map for, for Wasson Lane, slot one. Second. Second. Okay, uh, and and uh, Sam's here too, Our, the city planner, Sam Wessel's here too, if we have any questions for him. So uh, does the council have any questions or comments on this? Mr. Mayor. Yep, Mr. Gagne. Um, if I may, just for public uh, information purposes, uh, what is, and maybe Sam can answer this, what is the zoning for all of the uh, um, similar style buildings across the street um, from this proposed project? Could you repeat the question, please? I didn't catch the first part of it. Yeah, so what is the uh, zoning for all of the buildings across the street in, uh, from this proposed project? I'm going to quick bring up the zoning map. It's on a corner, so I want to make sure I'm looking at the same thing. Well, I can just share my screen. One second here. Hey, um, oh, there it is. Okay, can everyone see the zoning map? Yep. All right, so this orange is R2, which is what's being proposed for the property, which is right here. And then if you look at this whole row, there's uh, these are all twin home slash duplexes. If these were approved new today, we would expect these to be R2 as well. Um, they were zoned R1 at the time and continue as is um, since they were put in probably in the 70s or 80s, maybe. So it's going to be R2. And what's the orange there? That's also R2. R2. So it's Oh, sorry. That's R3. The yellow, the mid level yellow is R2. The orange is R3. But so going into this uh, area is very consistent with what's already there. Yeah. If you go across and these are all twin homes, even though they're zoned R1. Um, and then this is all R2 over here. And then R3. So if you're going from north to south, you're kind of building up an in intensity from single family homes to sort of twin home, duplex, and then small scale multifamily, and then finally arriving at the R3, which is the higher density. Fantastic. And then is this going to be a shared driveway? Did I see that correct? Yes, there's an easement on the certified survey map. And this is an agreement between the two property owners where the property we're discussing would have to allow the property just to the south. That's a township property in this little wedge here. Um, they are required to permit them access. Now, how that's going to work is the the city's not going to get involved in terms of um, requiring it to look a certain way. The developer will propose and we'll review it and we'll make sure that it's honored essentially. But um, with whatever concept they come up with, that's when it will be reviewed to make sure it meets what is required from the certified survey map. So that house that's been there for years, the little small house is actually a township property, yes. not a city property. Correct. So you can see the 
the sort of zebra line right. there in that little wedge right there. All right. I, um, and there hasn't been any negative uh, recourse as far as the shared driveway. They, everybody seems like they're on the same page and approval of it. Um, the property owner did raise concerns in terms of, you know, what's it going to look like? How's it going to function? Um, and that will all come in when we do development review. Okay. Um, those details will be hammered out at that time. Fantastic. I appreciate it. Oh, sorry. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. So, Christy, we have a first and a second on ordinance number 2020-08 to rezone and amend future land use map uh, for South Wasson Lane, Lot 1. We're first by Mr. Morset, a second by Ms. O'Dean. For voting, we'll start with Mr. Darnay. Yes. Mr. Plunkett. Or was that an I? Yes, that was an I. Thank you. Beerstead. Aye. Morset. Aye. Stoning. Aye. Wadeen. Aye. Watson. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so once again, we'll, we will close the council hearing and open up a pub, public hearing on ordinance 2020-09, amending chapter 16.10 of the Extraterritorial Subdivision of the Municipal Code. Um, so is there anybody in the audience that'd like to talk about this? John, I think we had a couple, we had a few people there that wanted to say something. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jerome Roadwall. Town of River Falls. Um, my purpose here tonight is to ask that you table the proposed changes to 1610 until such time as the towns involved have a chance to look at it and um, have their legal counsel look at it. Uh, we just got notice the, the second publication um, uh, less than 10 days ago. Um, so it, it caught us by surprise. We asked uh, Amy Peterson over a year ago to take a look at the ETZ uh, ordinances and do some, we know that need some work, um, but she indicated that it was not a high priority. So we we're a little surprised that this uh, uh, pops up now and with no notification to basically the citizens who are involved in this. You know, we can't, we can't vote for you. We can't vote you in and out of office, but you control uh, what we what we do. Now we understand that you feel that this is simply a platting uh, ordinance, which you're uh, entitled by state statute. But if you look at it, uh, it, it truly is a use ordinance. And that was uh, thrown out by the Court of Appeals over five years ago in the, in the case of uh, uh, Bank Delavan LLC versus City of Delavan. So we've known that this, this ordinance has been incorrect for some time, and we've been uh, hopeful of getting a, 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 a change, but uh, so far uh, we were blindsided by it. Uh, if you look at, and I'm going to pick out one section that's totally new, 16.10.160, uh, division into smaller lots. I have no idea what why this was added. There's five new items that says lots of less than 35 acres, but more than 10 acres may be created if in addition to the other requirements of this chapter, the applicant for the approval of the land division demonstrates all of the following. And A is the land division is consistent with the city's official map. Isn't that map a land use map? Think about it. It goes on with other things. Obviously, the streets, the services should be 
provided for, but why is it only 10 acres? Why not less than that or more than that? I, I, I don't understand where it's 35 acres now, and why are you making this split and distinction? Um, the last one, item E, the land division will not interfere with development of other lands within 1,500 feet of the lands to be div divided. Again, that's land use. And so I, I think our town's attorney should have an opportunity to look at this. The, the State Towns Association, I'm sure, would like to have a chance to look at it. And I'm asking you tonight to table it until such time as we have a chance to review it. Thank you. Is there somebody, somebody else there that would like to talk? Mrs. Smith? Oh, Mr. Plunkett? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Was, uh, I didn't catch which town uh, that speaker was from. Uh, River Falls Township. Hi, this is Diana Smith from the town of River, River Falls. I think Jerome really explained it quite well. Um, we do have concerns again that we didn't know about this, and I do understand it's different. Um, the subdivision plot access is different than our ATZ. Um, work with the town, with the city, but I do think that we should have been given notice of this and had a chance for um, our boards and our residents to look at it before you brought it this far. Is there anybody else there, John? Nope, that's it. Okay, so I'll close the public hearing and reopen up the council hearing and take a motion on this. Mr. Mayor, I move for approval of the ordinance uh, to amend the chapter 16.10 of the municipal code, ordinance 2020-09. Second. I'll second so we can have discussion. Yep. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Um, oh. Yep, go ahead, Mr. Simpson. So I'm available for questions okay. and can speak to things if, um, or I can introduce it if you'd like. Well, why don't you go ahead and then, and then the council can ask you questions after you're done, if they have any. Yeah, I think it's important for the record that the city certainly feels that this is a, um, a platting chapter and that this, this is related to focus on land division criteria. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if Mr. Rodewald misspoke, but the official map is not a, a use map. It's, it plats the street, future streets and uh, waterways and, and other corridors that would be impacted on land division. So that's um, different than a future land use map or, or others. And the, the language that was added was intended to clarify that it is in fact a land division criteria and certainly the towns have the ability to to review any ordinance they feel they'd like to review the staff would present that this is not the etz as it's been mentioned a couple times this which is a collaborative um, um section of of state law this is a plat plat review which and land division which is an exclusive um right of the the city in order to have orderly development. And so we've had an ordinance for some time um, related to that. And this is clarifying that the ordinance is related to land division um, and and can be um, implemented in the, in the opinion of our attorney. There isn't any reason for further review. Um, and certainly the towns are, are invited uh, and have been invited on multiple occasions that if they wish to discuss um, this and other topics that would be subject to a um, boundary agreement that certainly they're invited to do so, but I, I've suggested that they're at least not interested at this point in doing so um, in a comprehensive manner. So there's certainly been discussions about individual pieces of boundary. Um, in fact, in Town River Falls, the city had, had allowed uh, farmland preservation um, to proceed outside of the context of a 
a boundary agreement. So we've done some bits and pieces together cooperatively. Um, but frankly, this is a, a technical revision um, as indicated based on case law and, and the best advice of our, our attorneys to proceed with. Scott, if I could, I, I, I do have a question. I did see the 10 acre comment that Mr. Rodewall pointed out. I, I did see that in my review originally. Um, can, can, is there a reason we came up with that? If I think back to the Kinney uh, boundary agreement, I thought that we allowed down to five acres in that agreement. Is there a reason we came in at 10, do you know, or can you speak to that at all? I, I can just speak that the intention was to indicate that this was for you know, land divisions. And so that was a discussion between planning staff and the attorneys regarding, you know, what kind of number to use um, to, to give some, some understanding of what, what divisions are at stake here. I, there'd be a policy, to, the council certainly could change that number. Um, I think that our attorney would be fine if it was reduced to five acres. Um, I don't, um, I don't suspect that if it was increased to 30 acres, the attorney would think that that was, that was a good advice or advisable to do. Yeah, I, I'm not, Mr. I'm not Mayor. suggesting, I'm yep. sorry, Hal. I'm not suggesting that we change it. I was just looking for the methodology for how we'd landed at 10 when in the past we had had a five number in there. But so thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Watson. Um, I believe uh, just to answer back or <clears throat> follow up. Um, originally, we had a, a five acre and a 35 acre, and then that was the end of the possible divisions on a given um, on a given lot. Um, so in essence, we were able to, uh, and, and that five acre had a whole number, a lot of restrictions on it, um, uh, like who it could be, uh, who could use it and that type of thing. So, um, my, you know, my, m my personal opinion is that I would, to be honest, like to have, uh, this 10 acre number be higher. Um, but that, you know, given what our council is saying is that, you know, that he, he believes that this is the, uh, a defensible, um, uh, division, uh, line, you know, uh, that we can, that, that this is what we can defend and, and uh, you know, if we were challenged. So there isn't really a whole lot of case law around a number, uh, you know, different, uh, either 20 or five or, or whatever, but, um, uh, I think I have to follow our council at this point and, and, and go with it. Like I said, I would rather be higher because I, I would rather not see a um, uh, uh, small lot or even a 10 acre lot development happening all around the town. Um, I think it will make it harder for us to do the planning that we need to do and, and, and the future growth. But um, uh, I'm willing to live with this. Uh, in order to maintain overall the uh, this chapter of the municipal code. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> Gagne. Um, Scott, could you give us a little bit of history of what got us um, rehashing this and kind of jumping into this? Uh, was there a recent event that might have brought us into looking at this a little bit quicker? A little bit quicker. I'm um... Maybe not quicker is the right word, but uh, is there a reason why we're looking at this now versus, say, in a year from now? What what brought this back up on the table for us is probably a better way of saying it. Yeah, I think that we had we had the cir circumstance, I guess, to be corresponding with this attorney on a number of issues related to. Um, certainly, we had a the disputed annexation for man valley and so then we had talked you know it was kind of kind of been on the list of things to work on so um we talked to the attorney about what kind of work would be involved in in drafting that so we went went forward with it but um i don't know if mr watson or mr tolan can 
or, or the mayor have a, I guess, more specific answer, but that's how I recall the, the chain of events here. I mean, it's, and it, it does have to do with the um, case law that Mr. Rodewald had mentioned. Um, so that there's an interest by the city to be consistent with with the known case law out there regarding land divisions. I think the biggest thing I was looking for is there was a, um, some ETZ out in the town of Troy. Um, and there was some, is that, is this part of that? Uh, the ETZ would be a separate, separate issue. Yeah. All right. Mr. Mayor, that, I have a question. That sounds right. Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Versed. Uh, in the event of a future uh, boundary agreement, though, wouldn't this all be negotiable again? Both inside yes. and outside? Yes. Well, in the case of the, the town of Kinney boundary agreement, you essentially kind of bolt all these lines into a, a boundary. So ETZ right. and ET, ET, uh, J, which is jurisdiction or plat, it's ETP. I don't know if there's an official acronym, but you know, the ETZ gets thrown around kind of um, generically for all of this, but it's, there's specific statutory references um, to each of these, these different powers of cities, towns, counties in the state. So, but yeah, boundary agreements would help facilitate the discussion about all of these related matters, including the wastewater, I mean, essentially the boundary agreement then helps assure that you're going to have land divisions that will accommodate that future street, stormwater, et cetera. And that's the references in that section three. You know, it's referring to you can't divide a piece of property in a way that's not consistent with the official map where a future road was going to go or a storm sewer, you know, you're cutting off somebody else from their their ability to div divide the land because you've, you know, cut off the only point at which they can, um, if they were to, if they were to divide and use their land that uh, not use, they were going to divide their land. If they'd have the access to that future wastewater street and other things that would come right. through. Right. Um, and I, I think part of that goes back to Mr. Morissette's point about when he was talking about, um, our Kenny connect, uh, boundary agreement where we did agree on five and 35 and that's all subject to negotiations with our different boundary agreements. So uh, anybody else have anything on this? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Mayor uh, yeah, who, I'm not sure who's left first. Question for you. Yep. Um, does that five acre give um, our city more flexibility? Is that why we're choosing that over um, say 10? Uh, well, small, smaller, I don't, I'm, maybe Mr. Morris said, or Mr. Watson can describe it better, but obviously smaller, smaller, uh, developments, you know, land developments are better for the city moving forward. Cause like Mr. Watson had mentioned, we don't want all these five and 10 and 15 acre developments sitting around the city as we plan to move out. Again, the prime primary. Thanks mayor. The primary concern there is that the division of the land interferes with orderly development of your water, wastewater streets, right. and others. So, as we move forward, the, the smaller the the number, the more likely the division is going to interfere with those future um, developments, no matter what the use of the future division is. Um, Mr. Watson, I believe you had your hand up, and then Mr. Gagne, you'll be next. Uh, just to kind of uh, follow on uh, uh, Mr. Downing's point, uh, or just to comment on it. Um, remember, within a, uh, a boundary agreement, the city has the right to say yes or no at any time, pretty much for any reason, whether or not we want to accept a parcel into the boundary. So. There's a whole lot of other things that go into the land inside the boundary agreement um, after those negotiations that um, would make a five acre or some other kind of land division more or less acceptable. And ideally, we'd have a, you know, a, 
anyway, that's all I'll say. Yep. Uh, Mr. Gagne, you had something? Yeah, just for a point of clarification, um, you know, EW Homes, and it says it right in your background here, and that's kind of what I was looking for, uh, was seeking a waiver in a city's uh, subdivision, which was within the extraterritorial zoning. So I just wanted to bring that point up that this isn't something that we just wanted to come through and ramrod. Um, this is something that was brought to attention through another process uh, that came before the city, and we just want to clean that up essentially and bring, bring it up to code with what the state statutes was. And I just wanted to point to a specific instance. That way it didn't look like we were trying to go behind the scenes and just ramrod something. Um, it's us just cleaning up the ordinance, as Mr. Morse, uh, Simpson had said. said. So, thanks. Yep. Uh, anybody else have anything on this? Um, thank you, Mr. Yep. Mayor. Mr. Plunkett. Um, it may be more information from Mr. Gagne or, or the other folks that know more than I do on this. Um, does that uh, current issue that you're talking about make this a time critical matter for the city? Uh, or is there uh, the potential that we can put this off to uh, uh, allow these other entities time to uh, further understand what we're doing? Excuse me, Mr. Simpson. Scott, do yeah. you think? Yeah, that's a pol that's a decision of the council. If you want to wait, you know, enough. You don't. I'm not aware of anything that says if you don't get this done tonight, um, it can't be done. I would just suggest to you that we've gone through the process and publicly noticed and made our intentions know of of exercising a power that you have to to clean up an order ordinance that you're aware of. So yeah. you, whether you want to do it tonight or another night is up to the yeah. council. Yep. Any other questions on this or comments? Okay. Uh, Christy, I have a first and a second on the uh, ordinance 2020-09 amending chapter 16.10 of the extraterritorial extra subdivision of the municipal code. First by Mr. Morset, a second, or excuse me, Mr. Watson, a second by Mr. Morset. For the vote, yep. start with Mr. Morset. Aye. Mr. Watson. Aye. Mr. Plunkett. Aye. Mr. Gagne. Aye. Ms. O'Dean. Aye. Mr. Beerstead. Mr. Downing. Aye. Thank you. Seven years, zero unanimous. Okay, thank you, Christy. Okay, we're once again, we'll close the council hearing and open up a public hearing on a resolution authorizing special assessment police powers under section 66.0703 Wisconsin statutes for the benefit of River Falls Business Improvement District. Is there anybody in the audience has anything they want to say about this? Uh, this is John looking at the chambers. Nope. Nope. Okay. So I will close the I will close the uh, public hearing and open the council hearing and take a motion on this. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to approve the resolution uh, authorizing the bid district. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Questions or comments? Okay, Christy, we have. Oh, Diane, did you have something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Um, uh, one of the things I noticed when I moved to River Falls in 92 was how shabby the downtown was. And, and I just want to say that I think the bid district and um, its, its leadership and um, uh, the active participation of the merchants, down, merchants and property owners downtown has made a huge difference in what River Falls looks like and um, for the better. And I'd just like to thank them for their work on that. I, I couldn't agree more. Anybody else have anything? Okay, Christy, we have a first and a second on the resolution authorizing the special assessment police powers. First by Mr. Morset, second by Ms. O'Dean. Start on the vote with Mr. Watson. Aye. Plunkett. Aye. Beerstead. Aye. Morset. Aye. 
Gagne. Aye. Stoning. Aye. OD. Aye. Seven zero in favor. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Okay, next we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, first thing is a resolution approving renewal of health and dental insurance. Uh, this would be for the year 2021 with health partners. The next one is a resolution ratifying chief of police proclamation related to COVID-19. Uh, this would this resolution would ratify the proclamation of the chief of police dated September 30th, 2020. Uh, next is a resolution approving contract for services between the City of River Falls and the River Falls Public Library. Does anybody want to pull anything? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull number seven. Anybody else? Okay, I'll take a motion on the rest. Mr. Mayor, I move we approve consent agenda items six and eight. Second. Christy, we got a motion for uh, six and eight on the consent agenda. First by Ms. Odeen, second by Mr. Watson. Start the vote with Mr. Bierstead. Aye. Downing. Aye. Ms. Walcott. Aye. Odeen. Aye. Gagne. Aye. Watson. Aye. More set. Aye. Seven and in favor, thank you. Thanks, Christy. And Mr. Gagne, you have polled number seven. I polled number seven, um, just that I have to abstain. Okay. So I'll take a motion on number seven then. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we uh, approve the resolution ratifying Chief of Police proclamations. Second. Questions or comments on it? Uh, question for our police chief. Um, Chief Young, are you here? I think he has to be brought in. He's on the call. He's here. He's I am here. There he is. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can see me. Hey, Police Chief Young, how are you doing tonight? Good, how are you? I'm great, thank you. I wanted to know how you felt about the proclamations um, and the direction we're going right now, uh, as far as you feel and your, you know, and how you feel about it. I think the proclamations that we put in place have been working um, to the best of our abilities and through the direction of the city administrator, assistant city administrator, and public health officials. And as we um, go through these uncharted waters, uh, we will. Um, move them as we see what's best for the community. But I'm uh, pleased with how they're working so far. All right. Well, thank you very much and thanks for all that you do. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Anybody else have anything? Otherwise, Christy, we have a first and second on the resolution ratifying the Chief of Police proclamation related to COVID 19. A first by Marquette, second by Odeen. Start the voting with Mr. Plunkett. Aye. Odeen. Aye. Watson. Aye. Gagne. Abstain. Morissette. Aye. Downing. Aye. Beerstead. Aye. Six zero. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Okay, next move on to the administrator's report. If anybody has any questions for Scott, or Scott, if you have anything new for us, now would be the time. I'll just mention to the council that uh, attached to the report is the Wisconsin Policy um, Forum had a, uh, a look at how cities are reimbursed mm -hmm. through, particularly through the, for hosting state facilities. It seems to be a little timely given our presentation by the university, but the mayor and I plan to send a letter to the governor asking him to look favorably upon increasing the amount of reimbursement um, towards the services we provide to state facilities. Um, our tone has been in the past and I would expect it would remain that um, River Falls would be happy to host the university even if we receive zero dollars in payments from the state. Um, not all cities have taken that stand. Um, with their state facilities and they're suggesting that it's a burden too too large to take and that 
the only thing that they would be looking for is a hundred percent reimbursement. We haven't jumped on that bandwagon with the league of municipalities. Um, certainly there's a lot of benefits, um, beyond, beyond the money we get, uh, reimbursed for snow plowing and things. Um, but certainly it would be helpful if the state would, would, uh, fund closer to 100% of the costs that we have for, for those services. But uh, I think I speak for the mayor when I say we, we think, we certainly are careful in our tone about the facilities. Um, if, there was, if there was a new university being proposed, a 14th university being proposed in Wisconsin, I, I can guarantee cities would be interested in it, regardless of whether there was a, a reimbursement for services. So it, it is, it is to do with fairness. It is to do with equity. Certainly, we think the state could do a better job, um, kind of reimbursing for for costs, for basic costs. But um, just so the council's aware, and we'll be copying you on that letter. We we're happy to host the university. We'd like it if the state um, would provide a little bit better reimbursement for some of the basic services. But um, it's it's a great partnership. Otherwise, I take any questions. Anybody got anything for Scott? Scott, could you give us um, uh, a preliminary time frame on when we might hear or see a report on the on the on the lower dam and the damage that we have seen there and the drawdown and <clears throat> when would that when would you expect that to be coming to the council? Um, I would expect that it would first go to the advisory board. They've, they're going to get an update Monday, but um, I would say, I don't know if, they're, if the formal report would go to them in, in November before we would come to the council, but I'd say probably the, the first meeting in November might be the first kind of official time that the council, although I expect there'll be informal communication to both the UAB and the council prior to that, depending on when the, inspections are scheduled and and how dry things stay so they can try to make the inspection um, at this point it's been a kind of an informal inspection not a you know get out your tools and measurement devices inspection so that that's still yet to be coming thank you Scott, i'd be happy just to build on that real quick scott morissette we will be having a, a another a uh, little mini presentation next Monday at the Utility Advisory Board to give you folks an update on what's happened with the drawdown, They're going well, and the challenges we face ahead, and then some potential decisions that you'll be faced with in the next few months. So, be looking forward to that Monday. I, I look forward to it now. I'm going to mark it on my calendar special, so I'm <laughs> make sure I'm early to that meeting. Thanks, Kevin. Hey. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Gagne. Uh And those meetings are uh, cast on uh, YouTube, correct? Yeah, those, those yes. meetings are available for the public. Thank you. Yep. Question for uh, Kevin while he's still here. Yeah. How did the recycling event go this weekend? Um, the recycling event is this Saturday from 9 till 1 o'clock this Saturday. Mike Noreen um, will be there and checking people in and making sure we get all the uh, recyclables in the right containers. So nine o'clock to one o'clock this coming Saturday, the 17th will be for recycling. And then the last fall cleanup, I think we had very similar numbers to what we had for spring cleanup. I think we were 36 uh, cars less for the fall cleanup, but really good numbers around 1200 roughly. That's good to hear. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. good. Kevin, is there, is there, um, uh, in that recycling, this electronics recycling, is there a fee for any of it, or is there a fee schedule, or is it all free? Um, what I would do is I'd refer to the uh, River Falls Municipal Utilities website to get a list of the acceptable items. So there, there may be some that there is a fee, but I generally it's a free service. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I'd refer to the River Falls Municipal Utility website to get an exact list on that. 
And I, what, Kevin, what Kevin meant is you all pay a core fee in your uh, utility yep. bill, and so it's funded yes. as part of the fees that you pay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I should remind folks, too, that this the event is for River Falls Municipal Utility customers. So, Is, it, is this where I can put in a shameless plug for my weekly video? Because I have all that information on it today. I, I saw your video. It was awesome. <laughs> Everybody can get all that great information right there. I figured out why you had a cramp in your calf after you jumped off your soapbox, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, does anybody else have anything for Scott? Nope. Okay. So I have a couple appointments I'd like to make. Uh, I'd like the, the board to approve for me. Um, the first one is uh, I'd like to make a new appointment of Kellen Wells Mangold uh, through October of 2023 to the Board of Appeals. And I'd like to reappoint Brandon Doverton through May of 2023 to the Park and Rec Advisory Board. I move approval of the mayor's appointments. Second. Christy, we have first and second on my appointments. First by Mr. Downing, second by Mr. Morissette. We'll start with voting with Ms. O'Dean. Aye. Downing. Aye. Morissette. Aye. Gagne. Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Aye. Seven zero in favor. Thanks, Christy. Move to adjourn. Second. Christy, once again, we got a first and a second to adjourn. <laughs> this is gotcha. the one you've been looking for. <laughs> Start with Mr. Gagne. Aye. Plunkett. You're set. Aye. More set. Aye. Stoning. Aye. Odin. Aye. Watson. Aye. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, everybody.